Here is one of the school welders. This is a 208 volt Hobart 175 and the capacity of this machine is about one quarter inch. It's got one temperature control here ranging from one, two, three, or four and also there is below it a wire feed dial and this goes from zero to 100. I like to leave this about the middle and for about 16 gauge welding I'm going to set it on number two or maybe a number three. For thicker metals I would turn it to a number four. What you want to look at is make sure that there's nothing that's going to burn through and leave holes in your project. This machine plugs into this outlet right here next to the ventilation fan in the welding area. And up on the wall is the switch which will turn on the exhaust fan, the ventilation fan. Here's the on and off switch and when this is plugged in you turn it on you can hear the machine start up little fan inside so here we're in one of the welding areas here and you'll notice that there's usually a big block of metal here this is the table that we like to weld upon and you'll notice here there's a clamp this is the ground clamp which is part of the welder and it allows electricity to pass through the welding tip. If it is not attached to, to the, either the project that you're welding or to this block, it will not work. There has to be a full circuit to allow welding to take place. And next to that is the welding gun. And if I pull the trigger, you'll see the wire comes out. They are, that's why they're called wire feed. It comes from inside the welder, which has a spool all a big spool of wire and it feeds it through the torch handle so every time you pull the trigger this wire feeds out with electricity cur electrical current and allows the welding to take place usually have a leather glove around that's sometimes handy for handling hot metals and similarly here's a pair of pliers these pliers have cutters on them so what I often do is trim the length of the wire sticking out okay we like to keep this table as clean and flat as possible try to make sure that there's no overspray or, or welding that's done on them and if it gets rough what we often do is take an angle grinder and smooth it out here we have the welding area set up and several things I'm going to do before I begin remove the nozzle the nozzle off the piece and just remove with a pair of needle nose pliers, any debris that's gathered inside there. And that will allow the flow of uh, electricity and gas to improve. I'm going to slide that back on. I'm going to trim to length, just a little bit. You notice there's a pair of cutters on the side of the, of the, the pliers here. And I just want to trim the wire length down a little bit. Now, I have my, my block here, which I do all my welding on. That's to prevent the benches from getting damaged. I have my ground clamp attached to that block. I have a pair of gloves here, which I'm going to put on for added protection. Sometimes I don't work, uh, wear these, but if you're finding that the sparks from the welding process are getting onto your, uh, uh, are, are burning you, then we have a bit of a problem. And, and one thing about the welding area here is you'll notice there's no combustible materials. We've re removed paper towel and there's no uh, uh, rags of any kind. Because with the sparks from the welding we want to make sure that nothing can possibly flare up into a fire. I've also got two pieces of test strips here. These are, these are 16 gauge uh, sheet metal cut to width. Now they're narrow pieces and the reason why that is we don't want to waste material. And this is what I'm going to be demonstrating on today. Okay, when you're when you're welding pieces uh, for practice, you don't need to grab large pieces. Small pieces are good enough. And here's two. So I'm just going to place those on a on a nice smooth surface on here. And I'm going to talk about welding here. Now the first thing that we do anytime we weld two pieces together is we like to put small welds called tack welds. And I'm going to do that by carefully positioning my hand here and just for about two seconds 
replace a small weld. Here we go. And here's an example of what the tack weld looks like. It covers both sides, joining both pieces together. And it's not a very big piece, but it's enough to secure it. And the advantage of this is if it's not in the proper location, for example, if there's a gap between the two pieces, then we can break them apart and change them. Tack welds are used extensively for positioning any time that you want to see uh, two pieces joined together. Before I begin welding for the second part here to fill in the space in between, what I want to do is I want to talk about the position of the welding torque. And it should be at a slight 15 degree angle off center. And I'm going to be going in that direction. Okay? And you can go, once you have tack welds, you can complete the weld in one pass. But things you want to look for are is the heat building up too much to cause distortion. What will happen if it's too hot, you will see holes appear in your piece. And secondly, it will start twisting and bending. And we want to avoid that. One other thing about the welding torch position, I want to have it just about 10 millimeters away from my workpiece as I continue on. And I want to listen to the sound of the, of the welding process. It should be a nice clear sizzle, not a whole bunch of popping and hissing. Okay, nice sizzle. And as I go, what I need to do is go back and forth ever so lightly over the area where the two pieces will be joined together. And that, that will move weld from one side to the other and create a good bond. If done correctly, there should be very little need for weld or for grinding afterwards. And secondly, there should be good penetration between both sides of the metal. So here we go. I'm going to give a demonstration. I'll do about an inch here. I've got my helmet down, ready to go. Here's what the weld looks like and you'll see it's nice and even from one side to the other. It's not a big mound, but it's a series of nice flowing metal between the two pieces. Okay, this is a good weld and let's see what happens when we look at the other side. You can see a bit of penetration on the other side. That's an indicator of heat in this case that the metal has melted through the entire thickness and to, through the entire thickness of the two pieces. And that makes for a good strong weld. I'll continue on now and we'll weld the rest of it. Welded the other half there. Let's have a look at that. Now, at this time you should come and bring it to your teacher and you'll have a look at it. I'd like to see how your progress is going. And if you need more practice, what you can do is flip it over and do the other side. Then if you need still more practice, you can add a third strip to that. And one of the things that you should remember before you leave the welding area is that you clean up your test strips. I usually have a metal pail that's down below here that we discard them into. But remember, this is a hot piece still. And what you might want to do is go over to the bucket that's by the other welding area there that's filled full of water and dip it in there to quench it, to cool it down. And then we can dispose of it properly. Never throw these hot pieces into the garbage can because if there's other uh, flammable materials in there, it may be enough heat to cause a fire. Secondly, the last thing you need to do before you leave here, turn off the welder, clean up the area, and put all your tools away. And secondly, if there's other people around, you can put the helmet here until later on. Uh, for the next person to use. Please do not throw these plastic helmets on the workbench because if you've done, uh, if you've not done a proper cleanup, there may be hot pieces of uh, uh, metal there and I've had people melt the helmets and make them damaged and we don't want to do that. Okay, so that can hang off there. At the end of the day, all these helmets come back into the shop, into the, my main office.